Hello, and we are here. We are again keeping the path of discussing uh, global personalities changing the world with Dinis Guarda, uh, Cities ABC, Open Business Council, YouTube podcast series. Uh, we've been discussing in the first part of this interview, um, Pedro Gadanho, amazing body of work, his career, and a lot of the things that are combining, and as well, I would say, in crossroad between cities, countries, um, architecture, planning, and technology, and as well, the way we look at ecology and ideas. And as well, all these ideas are increasing more difficult to tackle when it comes to cities, to society, to our own organizations, especially with the advent of the complexity of, techno complexity of technology. So Pedro has quite an amazing uh, career, but as well as someone that is a thinker and a thought leader. So in the first part of the interview, we discuss a lot of his background and especially his, his first part of his career. I would like to touch in this second part, a lot of things he's been doing, working with global organizations, but as well the complexity of working with them and the success and the achievements he did on that. So Pedro, I would go straight away to your experience with MoMA. Uh, and I know that we touched that very top level, but let's start with MoMA first, because it's quite interesting that uh, leading one of the biggest uh, art and uh, architecture organizations in the world and uh, the achievements that you did there, because I think it's an interesting, uh, during the tenure of your uh, leadership there, there was a lot of interesting things that you did there. Uh, for me, it was uh, actually my first nine to five job. Um, and it was for me very exciting to enter uh, a high level organization, which has a very demanding professional culture, especially in regards to taking care of art and, and presenting art in the best way as possible. So for me, it was a, a steep learning experience in terms of how to deal with objects in a museum, uh, with conserv conservation aspects, with presentation aspects and so on. But at the same time was also an opportunity to have uh, a wider platform to reach to much more people uh, with themes that could be seen sometimes as polemical or, um, or slightly different, let's say, from the usual take of the museum. Uh, I came in as a curator of contemporary arts in the uh, architecture and design departments. And as such, one of my roles was to make presentations from the collection in the areas of architecture. Uh, but also to initiate uh, new projects. And for me, it was probably the most interesting aspect at the very beginning was to immediately, after nine months after I was um, settled in, to uh, do this exhibition from the collection on the political aspects of, of architecture. And that was for the American scene uh, quite uh, unusual and unexpected because people do tend to look at architecture more as a technical service than, uh, as I said before, either a cultural um, production or even a political act. But as we know, and we have mentioned already today here, uh, poli politics is about the polis, it's about cities. And so with every architectural act, you're actually imprinting some political meaning into the city. And that means that you could look back at history and at Momus collection, which is basically a collection of masterpieces uh, and try to find what were the pieces that brought some sort of political discourse onto the uh, city arena. And, and that was for me very fulfilling and it, it gave me a lot of positive feedback, but also uh, obviously uh, some um, indication that the, the status quo, namely the academic status quo, was immediately worried that their conception of what is political or not could be uh, challenged by uh, an exhibition uh, at a museum. So that was very interesting as a start, and I did several exhibitions uh, from the collection. But then one other uh, project that for me was fundamental was part of a series that had already initiated 
tackling uh, you know, the bigger issues of our society. The first one was dedicated to uh, rising waters by the uh, chief curator of the department, Barry Birdall. And then I was, um, I was, let's say, entitled to do the second uh, stance of this series. And I proposed that we should address uh, growing inequality in metropolises. Uh, and also how does a new, or how do new forms of urbanism top, uh, uh, go against the logic of top-down planning and allow for bottom-up tactics to actually mold and transform the city. And so what we did was to address six cities around the world, one in each continent, and, uh, and then finding groups that were already there working with communities and, and the cities and proposing that they would envisage the, the future of that metropolis uh, tackling issues of inequality. So how could people be more empowered to within their cities to uh, build a better future? And, and that was done in a workshop mode and then produced results um, uh, that were, let's say, visionary for each of the cities. And cities included from New York, in which we actually discovered that there was a lot much more inequality than expected to cities like Mumbai or Rio de Janeiro, in which obviously uh, you would already expect uh, a, a very stark and extreme uh, social and uh, economic e equality. So, but from that came ideas, new ideas on how tactical urbanisms, as they are called in the, in the discipline, could help uh, change the way we plan cities and envisage cities. And we looked at ex existing examples, but we also produced visions. And for me, the satisfying aspect, and I'll, I'll close here on that, was actually the fact that uh, people were coming out of a Picasso show just on the side, and then they would enter a very different universe. And uh, as I went through the exhibition several times, and you have mainly tourists coming to MoMA, uh, it was actually amazing to see that people that were coming from all over the world actually engaged and understood that there was something important being discussed there. And so it was a sort of interruption of the status of the museum as a sort of entertainment, intellectual entertainment to uh, becoming a platform that interrogates your daily life and, and your future. And that for me was really satisfying. And, um, and so I think I was very happy and privileged to have the opportunity during four years to start a number of uh, exhibitions. I think it was about 10 projects that I concluded in, the, in those four years. Um, uh, but at the same time, I knew that uh, the, over the next few years, MoMA was undergoing changes, expansion of its building. Um, and I knew that maybe opportunities weren't be, wouldn't be that big over the next few years to keep on that sort of rhythm. And maybe because I'm addicted to work, uh, I actually decided that I would go back to Portugal to help start this other museum, the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology in Lisbon, where I thought there, were, there would be more possibilities to do relevant work over the following years. That's well, first of all, congratulations, because I know that is not easy to tackle one of the leading museums in the world. And as well, all the complexity of politics, strategies, and as well, creativity as well, because you need to keep the creativity going, because in the end of the day, you need to get people to the museum and all of these things. So let's shift right now to Matt. Uh, so for people listening to us, and I would like for you to present because it's a very new museum, but it's a beautiful building. Uh, that was created from the scratch in one of the most icon places of Lisbon, close to the bridge. That is a bit of a, a not a, a bit, it's like a, the same generated by San Francisco uh, bridge uh, engineer, original founder uh, or creator. So I would like to hear about MAT, so Museum of Arts and Technology, uh, that uh, was created as a kind of a public private venture, uh, but as well as kind of something quite unique in the international museum landscape. Actually, actually, Matt was a private venture uh, that was even... It's completely uh, private. I thought it was... Private. And that okay. was even very proud uh, that it, it didn't have any subsidies from the European Commission or anything. So it was absolutely private. And, 
And it was obviously the investment of EDP, which is the biggest energy company in Portugal. And, uh, and it came out of a foundation, the EDP foundation that was already there for uh, about 15 years. And it's, so it arose as, as a way of, for the foundation to get a new visibility and uh, um, uh, a more impactful uh, activity within Lisbon. So there was a commission of a, of a London-based architect, actually, Amanda Levitt, to build a new addition to an existing power station that was already being used for exhibitions. And, uh, and this new building, of course, created many interesting challenges uh, because it's an organic architecture that really takes benefit from its location near the river. So it immediately became an odd spot in the Lisbon touristical offer. And uh, it very soon began, uh, became one of the spaces where uh, visitors to Lisbon wanted to, to come. And of course that presented challenges in terms of art presentation, but being an architect, I thought these challenges really made the museum different and um, quite interesting in relation to, to its peers. So the challenge there was basically how to transform this new structure uh, into uh, you know, internationally recognized uh, art, contemporary art museum. And I must say that contemporary art is, is possibly the, the strictest and more difficult field in the world for you to get in because it has very strict rules. It is very, it's a very small field that then has, of course, a big uh, or a, 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 an average uh, economic market behind it. But in itself, the world of art is very closed. And so for you in Portugal, in a peripheral situation, to get a museum going and, and have it recognized by its peers, it was for me the biggest challenge. And, and I think by having important artists that came and did work there, they, they became ambassadors for the museum and we conquered uh, uh, an audience that started by the art audience itself and then expanded to, to the general population. And that made the, the success of the museum to be able to get also that, that grip on the international audience and make it a player within a, a, a well-established contemporary art scene. So that was for me a big challenge. And that involved working with uh, big names in, in the field of art, like Dominique Gonzalez Forster, Tomás Saraceno, uh, Carlos Garaycoa, and, and many others, and have them make uh, very impactful installations in this oval space that is like the art of the building and create these installations that were simultaneously creating immersive experiences for the visitors, many of them uh, whom had never visited a, an art museum, and then at the same time uh, uh, establishing a critical discourse on what was going around us. And so curiously, the idea of, a, of, of having this museum focusing on art, architecture, and technology was not a way to make it um, as broad as possible, like many people thought, but it was a way of focusing the field that we were uh, entering in the art world. Because if you have art related to architecture and city or art related to technology, then you're already focusing on a, on a small but important part of what the art field is doing today. And that gave us focus, gave us direction, and allow us to choose our programs and define our programs really according to very clear goals. And that was very important for the success of the museum. And, and, and actually what, what I was very pleased about was that uh, people were not only visiting the museum for its architecture, because it was attractive, uh, on that realm, like many other museums uh, in, recent, in the recent history of Europe's uh, new infrastructural uh, uh, feats for, for culture, like the Guggenheim Museum and so on. But it was also an opportunity to uh, expand the audience for contemporary art, which I think is really important because it's where the critical discourse really is. So it's not in dead authors or modern art that you find the real importance of art today. 
It's in living artists that are producing discourse, that are producing reactions to the world around them, and therefore um, alerting people to subjects that affect them on a daily basis. I think many people do not understand that because I, effectively they didn't have an education that prepared them to engage with contemporary art. But uh, a museum like Matt was an opportunity to test those limits and to welcome more people to engage with contemporary art, which was for me very positive and, and fulfilling because I still see museums both with my experience at MoMA or at Matt, I do see museums as platforms to instill certain dialogues and certain conversations that the society still has to have, particularly in a situation where um, you start to face very big challenges in terms of environmental damages and, and the climate crisis. So we really have to bring those topics to the, the table and museums are, and effectively have become more and more a platform for those discussions to happen. It's uh, one of the most uh, important things. And we touch, of course, all the problems of art in the first part of our interview, but uh, let, let's continue on here. So from, from the perspectives of, um, of, of your career. So from your experience with Matt in particular, so working with a private organization that actually right now is co-funded by as well by the, by the Chinese mostly uh, funding and as well, what was the experience of, first of all, having that liberty, at least initially, to build all this infrastructure? Because one of the challenges with museums is underfunding, being dependent of too much political harassment, let's put it that way, and as well, uh, all the kind of uh, politics that come onto that. So can you kind of highlight, uh, of course, I don't want to go to the details, but just top level, what would be like the the most positive things that you achieved and the challenge that you see for museums worldwide, but in the case yeah. of using your experience? Well, first of all, it is important that there are also private institutions that invest in, in these museums, um, normally because they have collections and they have invested in art collections. And that is uh, super positive. And it's very important because we cannot rely exclusively on, on the site to guarantee that you both are keeping a certain heritage, but also activating that uh, heritage with contemporary discourse. But of course, then that leads sometimes to problems and tensions that you actually see happening around the world these days. If you're paying attention to the current status of the art world, what you'll see is uh, directors of institutions permanently resigning and being uh, and new searches for directors. and. And you start to wonder, why is this happening? And I think it is actually happening because there is a, a growing dissonance be, between boards and uh, the um, institution's directors, in the sense that directors want to use their programs and their collections to, to actually have a program that engages the people at a level that is uh, more complex and deeper and boards following what is populism emerging in the political arena, sometimes just want numbers, just want uh, popular uh, events and famous names, celebrities and so on, leading to obviously a situation of increasing uh, demagogy in terms of the role uh, of the museum. Uh, and I think this, this is a tension that has to be solved. And probably it was the tension that also for me determined that at a certain point, I didn't feel uh, museums were lo no, no longer the platforms in which I felt I could contribute towards some uh, change or some transformation that is needed uh, in our societies. And this is why I'm currently working with 19 municipalities with a big cultural project that may actually help transform a region. I mean, you cannot do that from a museum. Uh, of course, museums must, and they are trying to engage communities more and more. And so they must, in a way, go beyond their walls and, and, and really act out in the city. And I think there will be a tendency for that to happen more and more. Uh, but still, they will be restrained, as you mentioned, by budgetary 
issues or, or by tensions between different intentions of, of where the museums will go. And so in a way, uh, as we know, uh, with bigger issues, you actually have to also involve policymakers and you have to involve other actors of society so that uh, um, a change really happens. And it, not, it doesn't come only and specifically only from awareness, which is what museums can do best, which is raise awareness. But there is a certain point at which you have to go beyond awareness and you have to actually have an impact on what people are doing uh, at the level of their uh, daily lives. Definitely museums are going through, yeah, it's a complex thing, like you put it, it's quite interesting. And I think it's, it's even more complexing with all the things happening with uh, COVID and things like that, because of course, right now, a lot of museums are dependent of international audiences, a lot of things. And of course, this will create a lot of other issues that uh, probably is, is for another conversation on its own. So continuing with your, with your um, experience and we discuss, uh, of course, MoMA and Matt. So I would like to talk right now, your work that you've been doing almost all your career. Um, what I would like to understand is, so for me to, to see is, so you've been creating some of the leading global architects, both young generation and the and the older generations. Um, they may be collaborating from the likes of Ram Kulaz and a lot of big names, but as well the young generation, the DFVs of Faustino and a lot, a lot of others that, uh, that you know very well and they've been creating both in Venice and all over the world. So how do you see the, first of all, the creating world? Because of course, like you said, the creators, our thinkers, our researchers, and you have some like a couple of like 10 super curators worldwide, uh, like uh, uh, Ansel Rich, Old Rich, and a lot of others that are like the super curators that are always in the top level. And there are some curators that appear and disappear and so forth. But I'd like to hear this part of the curating world and the relationship with big events like the Venice, the Viennals, like the Venice Viennale, the Sao Paulo and even big uh, international art events. So how you see the, the role of the creator and the role as well of this kind of the shifting because this is all shifting to digital and to kind of hybrid uh, systems. From my point of view, of course, and I talk from my experience, curators are like mediators. So they help content arrive to a certain audience. But at the same time, they are also influencers in the sense that by their choices, they will determine those that are uh, mostly discussed or seen or appreciated. Um, so in that sense, of course, they are actors of the process of legitimation that Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist, used to talk about, especially in the field of art. Um, but I see them, of course, as you may notice from my discourse, as agents that have a political responsibility in that respect. Traditionally, a curator is just one that helps conserve a collection. That is the, the idea of curare, of taking care of. So by traditional, the curator would be someone who was only taking care of the collection and taking care of its presentation to the public. But I think that role has become much more complex because a curator became someone who triggers dialogues and conversations and uh, inclusively enters in a dialogue with artists to provoke them to do a certain work or, or to direct their responses to certain areas because they launch themes, they launch ideas for exhibitions that to which then uh, art, uh, artists or architects or designers are asked to, to respond. So in that sense, of course, I would say there is an ethical um, background to what you do because you are in a position of power somehow, because you have the ability to reach audiences and to bring some uh, questions to the fore. Uh, and therefore you, you have to deal well with that responsibility. And, and in that sense for me, of course, they are figures that People even questioned that they were becoming the stars of the whole artistic process. And I do agree with that criticism because that shouldn't be the case, but still they do have importance if they perform uh, their uh, role well. There is another dimension which I think may merge from what I've been saying and which I think is very important. I mean, when I was very young, 
uh, I was listening to an album that influenced me greatly, not only because of the music, but also because of the title of that album. This was uh, Maximizing the Audience by Wim Mertens. And for me, as I, as I think I mentioned already, for me, the idea of maximizing the audience is the key. It's really bringing important aspects to bigger and bigger audiences when we know that we are competing with very superficial topics in, 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 in the realm of people's attention. So I think that role is also political in a sense because you are fighting for attention for certain issues, uh, but you are also uh, opening up the uh, possibility that more people engage with culture, forms of culture that are important to our identity and to our progression as humans. And this is also why as a curator, I became uh, over the last few years since I did the Ecovisionaries exhibition at MAT, I became totally committed to the environmental uh, crisis because I think it is truly uh, the, the next big thing. And many people say uh, COVID was a dress rehearsal for the, the crisis of, of climate change. But I think uh, the scale is it's, it's incomparable because it will be much worse in terms of, uh, of what will happen as a consequence of, of climate change. But at the same time, uh, because it's delayed in time, and it's what Rob Nixon called slow violence, it's something that most people cannot understand in its impacts because they're slow, they're, they will come, and maybe not even for our generation and just for our children's uh, generation, people are not impelled to take action immediately. And therefore, you do have to, as a curator or as any other actor in the field, I mean, if you're dealing with cities, inevitably, you have to be addressing that aspect right now. Um, I think you have the res responsibility once you've become aware of the scale of the problem, you cannot do anything else but that because it's too problematic, it's too big. And, and of course, we shouldn't be arrested and just be depressed because <laughs> these, uh, these, these might be altering our ways of life, but we have to do what we can in our respective fields. Uh, and we have to be preparing in our respective fields for what are going for sure, at least if we listen to the scientific discourse currently, uh, what will be for sure uh, something that will change our, our lives as maybe nothing before in terms of speed, actually. Even if it's slow, it's also fast if you look at a geological scale, right? I mean, for us as humans, uh, changes that may happen in 30, 40 years uh, are difficult to grasp. But if you take those changes in terms of geological time, they're happening, they're happening like in a blip. Uh, because we're talking about hundreds of millions of years of history uh, that suddenly are accelerating into a process that uh, in a few years we cannot actually stop. And so I'm actually very worried about the COP26 being already announced as a failure uh, because that means that we are again postponing decisions that are very important. But I do think that we as professionals from our fields, companies, uh, professionals in all areas have to sort of introduce their themes in their dealings, their current dealings, and that will actually affect um, change even before governments take a political position to advance in that direction. Yeah, it's a big, a big field, and I think it's quite complex because it, it, there's a there's a short term implications for everything we're talking about, yes. but there's a yeah. of course medium long term consequences, and of course. It, in the history of the world, this is nothing, but in the short term, in the next decades, it's massive. And I think in the end of the day, it's the problem, how are we going to be managing this when people are, of course, there's all so much contradictions and a lot of so contra information and, and they even a lot of uh, contra-reactionary propaganda that doesn't want to see things happening in front of us. But um, I want to touch uh, before going, and, and of course, I want to go to the concept of your last book and research. But before that, I want to touch as well the work you did. It was a long time ago with the experimental design. Of course, it was a collective work, but you were one of the founders and as well creators. And the experimental design for people listening to us was an organization created uh, 
probably more than 20 years ago in Portugal. And, yeah. um, and it has impacted the world design uh, internationally and as well had a lot of impact initially in Lisbon, but as well international in a lot of ways. And it still has a huge, uh, um, I would say, presence in the design of the architecture world and as well in, I think, the design overall world. So if you could give a bit of that insight and experience and what is experimental design for the ones not, I know that you're no longer involved directly, but I'm sure that you still, as the co-founder, you still have a lot to say. Well, I was not a co-founder. I actually joined in 2001. Uh, Sorry for the, the, the changes. <laughs> I got it wrong. Uh, yeah, the, the, this event started in 99. And it, it was trying to bring design culture to Lisbon. There were already very interesting designers uh, operating uh, in Lisbon. But there wasn't yet an event that would bring design to the fore. And, and reveal it as a tool to also change the, the, the face of the city. And, and that was, I think, the success of experimental design. It came at the right time, quite early, to demonstrate that a, a cultural event could actually uh, change the profile of a city, at least in terms of its international visibility, because that was also an important role for experimental design. It was its ability to reach out to um, cultural communities abroad and, and call attention to a small peripheral port, uh, country that had been isolated from Europe due to a fascist regime for more than 40 years. And so it came already uh, quite a few years, of course, after our uh, revolution that led us to democracy in 1974, but it was still part of that process of entering Europe and becoming a part of Europe. And it was probably, yes, one of the most important cultural events uh, to promote that integration of, of Portugal and Portuguese um, cultural actors into the wider European scene. And, and so that was very important. It was m more important even because it was an independent organization. So it was not a state-led organization. It was not, it was of course supported by the city and the states and European funds, but uh, it came from really independent agents. And that gave it also a quality of uh, having a curatorial direction that was very free and very, uh, if you want, very avant-garde that could really address topics that were emerging in the fields of design culture, bring every important designer to Portugal at the time and create projects that really, um, that really were new for the generality of the Portuguese audiences. And, and in that respect, I was happy to participate in those, um, let's say three to four years in which the, the, the biennial really expanded in terms of budgets in terms of presence in the city in terms of the number of events number of participants and uh, and in fact in becoming something that was uh, much a part of the uh, cultural offer of of lisbon every two years in fact that was the period also in which we found it strategic to change the idea of the event just as an event that um, happened every two years to the idea of a Lisbon biennial, which was the first one and the one that up till today is still the only one that happened with that designation uh, and may, uh, took advantage of those ideas that biennials are a place of convergence of, the, uh, of, the whole, of these professional sectors but also a way to expand audiences for, for these creative disciplines. Definitely a great event for people that were part of it and is still moving forward and reflecting a lot of these things. So I, I wanna probably in wrapping up uh, this because we, we've been through a lot of stuff. So you are as well an author and you have a new book coming. You work as well with Harvard and a lot of other universities still teaching in, in the university in Portugal. Can you tell us a bit about your work as a researcher, as a thought leader, as an author, and as well, um, your upcoming book? I think things are very interdependent. I, I don't manage to separate these into fields. And I've always thought of curating as a way to prolong uh, the writing and the research involved in, in writing, uh, but just a way that instead of using just text, uses, you know, multi, 
uh, multimedia way of presenting a topic and discussing a topic. So my research was always very oriented towards producing exhibitions. And, uh, and I, although I, I taught at the Oporto University for a few years as a design, uh, architectural design teacher, uh, then I left university for a few years and I went back to Harvard uh, precisely when I came out of MAT to focus and specialize on the issue of climate change. And so this was an opportunity to actually self-tailor a course, taking advantage of all the offers in Harvard. Uh, in, in, in respect to uh, uh, climate science and everything around it, from economics to, to, to politics and social justice and so on. Uh, but that led, of course, uh, to the idea that if I had uh, uh, sort of aggregated all this knowledge from different disciplines on what was happening around me, I felt it as a responsibility to you know, not to lose that memory and just put it in a book. And of course it is a book that is uh, prolonging that idea that if I as an architect recognize that there are potential solutions and ways of changing the profession that will make it adapt to uh, what is coming, then it's my responsibility to share those ideas and, and, and try to, uh, expand a little bit the information and knowledge that people are actually missing so that they can act. And so basically I decided to put that in a book called Climax Change. And, uh, and the play of words relates to the idea that architects are very driven by these aesthetical climaxes. So if you look at modernism, it was a big change from classic architecture and it was driven by these different uh, modern language of architecture. And so there was a powerful presence of aesthetics in changing the way architects uh, uh, had their profession going. And so I thought that at this period, we need a similar revolution. And so we need a climax change. We need a, a change in the aesthetics per, aesthetic pursuits that architects will, uh, will have in order to respond to the challenges of um, the, an ecological crisis. So the book actually goes into all these areas that can inform how we make cities uh, so as to make, it, as to make them more sustainable, more resilient, and uh, looking at the paths that you have in different areas to actually uh, start uh, enacting the change in the profession because uh, as probably people do not know, the area of construction, buildings, building maintenance and so on, accounts for 40% of the carbon dioxide emissions in all of the world. So this means that this is one of the sectors that has drastic, to drastically reduce its imprint, carbon imprint. And that means that you have to find ways of doing architecture in a whole different way, to plan cities in completely different ways, and that will require a lot of thinking from multidisciplinary sources. And that's what the book tries to address, to create an alert, a sort of manifesto on the urgency of change and how you can actually enact that change. Because you cannot just say that you have to change and leave it to chance. You really have to show that there are potential ways to solve uh, the problems that we're facing. And uh, I think this should be doing, uh, People should be doing this in any area. And I know that businesses and companies are already making their roadmaps for change and decarbonization. Uh, but in all areas, you have to think of fields like the aviation field. They have to be thinking about how we will solve these uh, problems of decarbonization. And, and that's what I try to do for the field of architecture, uh, trying to show people that there is an opportunity actually for positive change and still for keeping the creative and aesthetic edge of architecture as a cultural production with impact on society. So this is where the book is going. And actually it's being affected, its production is being affected by the supply chain crisis because there is no paper to print the book right now. And, uh, and I feel it's rather urgent to have the, 
the book out there, obviously, because even, you know, students and young professionals are coming out, they have no clues on what to do. They might want that change, but they don't find information easily on what kind of paths you have to start improving things, even at a small scale level, because all efforts accrued, then you might have a, a bigger change. This is actually the biggest, uh, probably the biggest topic of our times, uh, together with, of course, mental health and other very yeah. sensitive, more human topics. So as an architect and someone that has been managing strategies for cities and other things, um, how can we go from the theory to the practice? Because the challenge right now is, and, and of course you touched these things, but I want to go a bit more direct question is, so there's a challenge of perception, okay? The perception in terms of, uh, First of all, there's still a bit divide, not a bit, a huge divide between people that believe on, on climate change or not, uh, whatever we want to accept it or not. I think it's ridiculous that we have still people in the 21st century that have problems to accept that, um, but it's a fact. Uh, secondly, is that this has a massive implications, both economical, social, and, and uh, as well structural, because you cannot just stop a huge part of the world economy. And, and further is that our cities and our economy and our society is not prepared psychological for this. So how can we, and I'm sure that your book touches this in more detail, but from a top level perspective to bottom down, let's say if you think about three or four things that we can do for this, what can we really effectively do? Because that's the challenge right now is that, okay, uh, as we're speaking for this is trending on Twitter that uh, Arnold Schweizenegger wants to stop pollution. And of course, this is better talk than said. So is, is the point is that, okay, we all know that, but are we going to stop traveling? Are we going to, you mentioned the airlines and the aviation. So it's a big, big thing because you cannot just stop flying and top, stop the entire economy. Um, if you look at the oil and gas, of course, right now in the US, for instance, even during this week, we speak, we are in October or actually end of October, 2020 for the people listening to us in the future. Um, for instance, in the US, there's right now a, a tentative of starting to, to put an official blame to the oil and gas companies about this but more than blaming is how can we right now tackle the problem on a global scale because this has to be tackling the global scale it's like the vaccine we cannot just stop covid if 90 percent or 80 percent of the world population for instance in africa only five percent of people got the vaccine and you still have a lot of people in the in the western world even uh, questioning the importance of vaccine so I just want to like to see how you see these things on a very practical level and at least four or five right. elements that you can look at this. Yeah, I will try because the, the problem- yeah, it's a big one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the solutions are also many. Uh, so it's hard to say which ones are better and it depends on the fields you're talking to. But if we focus only on cities, I would say that first, the perception is already there and it's changing. Even if COP26 fails, at least you know that every newspaper, uh, every um, TV show, uh, TV news show is talking about the fact that it's going to fail. And so, and they are explaining what the COP26 is, and they are explaining why is it important <laughs> if it fails or not. So people are becoming certainly more aware of the urgency of the problem, and that's super positive. But then, of course, people do need to understand what kind of solutions are there that don't totally dis uh, dis disrupt their lives and just uh, drastically reduce their quality of life because that's what they are afraid of, right? And so I would say that a level at the level of cities, of course, there, are, there have been uh, strategies that have been identified depending on what kind of a city you have and what kind of climate you are in that can immediately start to respond to, uh, to these issues. For instance, um, uh, urban agriculture in cities and reforestation of cities are sure ways of starting to decarbonize to give you a better quality of life. And it's an, a, an option of investment that you can start making right now and producing results immediately. So that's only for a good example of what it can change. But if you are in a city that is prone to problems of heat highlands and so on, there are solutions so simple as painting your uh, roofs white, which some cities have already in, uh, uh, put into their planning uh, strategies for the coming years, because that reduces 
two to three degrees in the um, environment around the, the buildings. And these, these are amazingly simple things that have made the cover of New York Times already. But of course, not everybody's paying attention to the fact that these solutions are already there. So that's a very practical, easy one that people have been discussing. But when it comes, for instance, to the work of Cities ABC and the idea uh, that, of course, we should be improving cities based on data and technology, I would say that instead of a paradigm of purely tech cities, uh, I would take on the, the, the expression of fintech and I would change it into ecotech. So you have to make sure that the technology that is being implemented right now is already an ec ecologically sustainable uh, technology. And that is possible because the technology partially exists. Not everything exists. There are many things that are considered by scientists at this point, magic bullets and magical thinking. Why? Because the technology is not yet available to make it uh, uh, commercial and mainstream at a level that is an effective response, because there are already experiences in carbon sequestering through machines, uh, machines that are capturing uh, carbon directly from the air. But this is a small company startup in uh, Switzerland, Climeworks, that is producing a machine that is extremely expensive and that cannot yet be reproduced at mass scale. So it's what scientists are calling a silver bullet. But of course, if you start planning and governments and city governments are starting to plan already with these technologies in view, when they become available uh, in terms of price and in terms of uh, the actual uh, uh, machines, you actually can start inserting those already into your plans. So I think cities are actually aware of decarbonization uh, targets, and then the problem becomes purely political. It's like waiting for the time in which the public opinion changes so that you can already implement uh, that, um, that uh, measure without a huge protest. You see these in Lisbon right now with uh, uh, you know, cycle, cycle lanes and, 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 uh, and bike lanes. I mean, it's still a discussion that we shouldn't be having anymore. <laughs> of course, we should be introducing a, ch a congestion charge like London did years ago, start investing in public, in public transport and in, uh, in bike lanes. But people are still afraid of going ahead with these discussions because there is still not a political consensus about it. So I don't think that that big divide that's only three, four years ago was still very present, still exists because nobody in their right minds is able to deny the impact of climate change at this point, not even American Republicans. But at, at the same time, people are still afraid of the social impact of certain measures that have to be taken. And this is where I think uh, creating a discourse, creating the right discourse also helps city governments uh, go in the right direction. And that's, anyone can help do that, like a platform like Cities ABC. It's, it's quite complex and you touched a lot of very key things. Um, so I think we, we're going to wrap up here, we pass uh, one hour. So um, one probably final note, and I know that you're still uh, full of energy to have a, a, a new part of your career even bigger. Um, so from, from your experience, and I think probably as a summary, last question, um, and uh, what would be the, I think, special for people listening to us? Because I think one of the things that uh, uh, for me is, that's why I created as well this channel and, and actually everything I'm doing, and I shift as well. I work with you in the past in more in the cultural environment, but I shift to be much more entrepreneurial and much more technology driven because you have much more control over your own um, first of all, your own actions, you're not dependent of countries and there's thousands and thousands of platforms worldwide where people can actually make money, can engage on these, we discuss NFTs, we discuss a lot of other things, but that's one thing definitely that is for me probably the biggest challenge is that people are still not understanding the power they have and, and I think the power is power for movement, for the artists to get more funding, for the artists to get more voice, for using social media, not just for stupidity and for bullying, but as well to promote great causes, um, using crowdfunding platforms, using crypto even to raise money. For instance, if you look 
just an example, of course, it's a crazy example, but if you would have invest uh, $1,000 in, in, in one of the, the coins, you can actually get, actually in the, in the case, there was an ex, extreme crazy uh, this week, which is another paradox of the paradox of our society is that if you would inv invest in the, this dog coin, not the dog coin of uh, the other one, the Ching, Ching coin, I always mix the name. Um, if you would invest $8,000 uh, two weeks ago, no, one year ago or something like that, you would actually right now have around <laughs> a couple of billion dollars, which is of course a paradox, okay? Um, and I'm not asking anyone to trade and, and get into this crazy stuff. But my question is more in the sense, there are tools, okay? Wherever we looking or not. And one of the challenges that is for me very irritating and as well very dangerous is that these tools are not being used by intelligent people. They're using it for blaming, they're using it for the negativity, but not really for empowering people. And I think this is the main point. So as a teacher and as someone that has been always empowering people, and of course, working with 19 uh, uh, cities um, or towns, what would be the, my question right now is, is, how can we really go from this? And, and I think especially from your experience, of course, because we can only say from our experience, how can we actually make sure that people use these things uh, for their own sake, because that's what we're talking about with this series and everything we've been doing. That's a very difficult question, of course. And I was trying to think what could be an answer that is comprehensive enough. And, uh, and I do believe that uh, technology will offer uh, the solutions that we need to overcome our current problems. But there are also social and political issues that we have to deal with. And we have to come together as a society to, in fact, eventually put pressure on governments to take the right decisions. And I think those kinds of activist movements are growing and they are no longer fringe movements. They are becoming truly mainstream. And you can find a grandma of 80 years old at the same level of a five-year-old child uh, protesting for, this, for the same causes. And this means really enacting the change that, that we need. And I think this will become more and more evident. But people do miss understanding what are the tools that they have on an everyday level, both in companies or at their domestic settings, as to produce some change. And, uh, and there is a wonderful book, which I will recommend. Uh, it's called Drawdown by Paul Auken, which sort of made a roadmap of all the possibilities to, to reduce carbon in every area uh, from small scale to bigger scale. And I think this is a very useful tool for people to just go and browse through those and find the ones that they can actually engage with, either with their companies, with, their, with the technologies they're dealing with, either with uh, their own families and see where they can do something. Because if, they, if everybody does something, then the problem is solved. The question right now is still that even if people are aware and even if people uh, do understand the problem, they still feel it's not up to them to contribute to the solution <laughs> because they don't find even the, the, the ways to do it. And I'm not talking about recycling or doing your own compost because those measures are proven to be useless if there is not a, a bigger collective effort at level of policy making, at level of governments, at level of society in general, those efforts will uh, not add to anything. Uh, of course, you should do those things because they will feel make you better, but at the same time, you should have use the tools that you have in your businesses, in the ways you're operating uh, in your cities and in your private life, just to do something good. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about a, a, a better conscience. It's really that uh, creating a, a bigger movement that helps uh, people make the change they need. If we don't want to be basically reduced to, you know, 1 million or 2 million survivors in 200 years from now. Uh, because that, that's also what you could see. I don't believe that, like many scientists do, that uh, uh, humanity is moving towards extinction because we actually do have the technology to survive, but we may survive in very small numbers. 
And if we are now have 8 billion people and we, we can expect only the 1% to survive, that's very harsh, right? And so that means that people either understand that and grasp that difficult idea and start acting at their own small individual level uh, or else, you know, you're just uh, leaving uh, not so fun heritage to your grandchildren. I think amen, like they say. I hope we, we take this series and for everyone listening to us. And I think even me, I'm learning every detail. And uh, yeah, we have much more power than we think, but we use it not in the most intelligent way. We, I think yesterday I did a fantastic interview and one of you were talking is about we live in some kind of fantasy bubbles. And I think all of us try to protect ourselves in our fantasy bubble that is created by well, whatever imagination we are able to do with technology. But sometimes we have to, to work on these directions. Um, thank you so much for this exciting two parts interview, Pedro. Um, I think everyone will probably want to discover more about you, the ones they don't know, and uh, they should definitely to find more. And I think you're going to come back to recurrent things with, uh, with other things you're going to be doing together. It's a pleasure to have you here. Muito obrigado. Pleasure as well. Thank you for the platform.